Stay on schedule here. My name is Jonathan Lay, and I'm one of the three uh, organizers of the conference. I think that Sean introduced the, introduced the three this morning before Brian's first presentation. Um, the Wyoming Pastors Network wanted to take a few minutes here in the middle of the day to kind of um, introduce uh, what the concept is um, and uh, uh, maybe answer some questions that you might have about it. Um, on the registration table, there is a, uh, a sheet that's available for anybody that wants to pick one up um, with the uh, mission statement and the list agreement. Um, and uh, that was a, what we worked out um, after our legislative session uh, last uh, January, February. Um, and I wanted to just talk about the, uh, the concept of what we're trying to do. And I'm going to talk about it under three headings. Um, Three words, Wyoming, pastors, network, and what the significance of each of those three words are. As all of you know, Romans 13 tells us that every governing authority um, will be held responsible before God by the way that he governs. Of course, contrary to the misconstrued rules of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, uh, we don't believe that. Um, and you know, when you have a government official as a member of your congregation, whether it be a city council person, state legislator, uh, uh, a U.S. legislator like Cynthia Loomis, or a governor like Jan Brewer, uh, your job as a pastor, in part, is to call them to account to govern in the way that's according to the will of God. This doesn't mean you tell them how to do their job, but it does mean you encourage them to live according to their faith. In the history of the Christian church and its interaction with the state, um, perhaps the, the earliest and most uh, significant example of just exactly this kind of pastoral leadership um, happened under the pastor of the Ambrose of Milan. Um, Ambrose of Milan was um, the pastor to the emperor Theodosius. And uh, well, some bad things happened in the town of Thessalonica of the famous of first and second Thessalonians. And Theodosius as emperor wanted to do what emperors do, and that is to punish the town. Um, and his plan was to gather up the town into the, uh, the Colosseum and uh, to slaughter uh, whoever showed up um, as a retaliation against the town. Um, Pastor Ambrose said, no, that's not the way we govern. Theodosius did it anyway. Ambrose excommunicated him, and he remained excommunicated until such time as he repented publicly um, before the church. It was a very significant uh, uh, point of history. Um, but again, it's an example of how we um, are, are, are leading our people to live out their lives in every realm in which they live, according to the word of God that we preach. So there is no wall of separation between Christianity and your governmental task. Now, here's the thing that clicked with me just a month or so ago. Guess what? The United States of America has a unique form of government. In the United States of America, every single citizen over the age of 18 is a government official. They they exercise their governance by casting a vote once a year and by participating in public debate. And that's why the First Amendment to the Constitution is the First Amendment, which both guarantees the freedom of the exercise of that governing official will by, speak, by speaking, and also included in there is the freedom of religion, the free exercise. So the Wyoming Pastors Network starts with the talk about the state. And we are interested in what is good for the state um, and recognizing that, uh, uh, that this is not simply something that congregations are 
permitted to do as a kind of an optional extracurricular activity, but it's part and parcel of a pastor's charge to teach the whole counsel of God. Mm. Now, pastors. That's right. This brings us to the second word in the trilogy, Wyoming Pastors Network. Why is this network focused on pastors? Why not include all people, or at least all Christians? It's a fair question. And the answer is that you know as well as I that each pastor personally is giving charge over his flock, personal responsibility to shepherd the flock of God, as St. Paul says in the 20th chapter of Acts, to pay careful attention to yourselves and over all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Wyoming Pastors Network respects that God-given accountability. No serious-minded pastor that I know of, including myself, is willing to hand over unfettered access to the ears of my sheep. And I know that you wouldn't either. The very fact that you're here today tells us you're a serious-minded pastor. And as much as we might respect one another, we take personally our responsibility to teach according to the doctrine of our church bodies. And so, the WPN doesn't want to insert itself into that God-given responsibility. We recognize that only you are in a position to judge when and how and in what words and by what means the people that you care for in your flock are given information about that you might receive from the network. <clears throat> we don't insist that everybody react to the information that we might be able to disseminate in the same way. We recognize there's going to be all kinds of differences. It's where do you stand in, in terms of the work that you've previously done in your flock? Are they, are they prepared to the point yet that they're, they're able to participate in this particular legislation? Or, or do you use your pastoral judgments to say, we need to sit with this one out and I need to do some, some more teaching in Bible class before we can bring this one up? Uh, that kind of, uh, of judgment is yours and yours alone. And so we don't want direct access uh, to, uh, to build a, a huge mailing list of all the Christians in the state. Um, we simply want to be able to network. We want to be able to defend your right to make those decisions. Now what you'll notice in the list agreement is there's only one thing that the, uh, that the WPN does ask of its members, and that is that we treat uh, with confidentiality and care the information that we pass on for the simple reason that if we are passing along proprietary information, um, nobody here wants it used by anybody else in a way which would undermine the stated goals of the Wyoming Pastors Network. And that's why we're so clear in stating the goals and so narrowly focused in what we do. There's a thousand things that Christians are concerned about and ought to be concerned about. Um, but we have deliberately chosen to focus our network's uh, work on three things, on the sanctity of marriage, on the sanctity of human life, and on the free exercise of religion. So, for the sake of the other members of the network, we simply ask that you uh, watch over yourself, that we uh, be careful with the information that we, we use and pass on here, and for the, uh, the pastors that join us tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow morning, in the central ballroom, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that in, in some detail. Uh, but that brings me to the third uh, word, Wyoming Pastors Network. This word was not chosen lightly. Um, this meeting has been over two years in the making, and uh, we've had a lot of time to think about what we want to say. This word network is meant as a precise description of what we intend to accomplish, no more and no less. And we did not use the word association, not only to distinguish ourselves from the Wyoming Association of Churches, because, but because association is not the word we want. We didn't use the word organization or coalition or fellowship or any such thing, because those words speak a unity of being 
which we're not claiming for ourselves. <laughs> we would love to achieve, this, achieve it someday, and by God's grace, maybe someday we will, but we don't want to be hindered in the work that we can accomplish by what we haven't yet achieved. And so, network. Network. Network it indicates one thing and one thing only, and that is the real-time sharing of information. The network allows us to share particular kinds of information without threatening the doctrinal integrity of anybody who receives it. So, just want to be very clear here. This may be disappointing to some. Maybe it's um, uh, a load off your chest. I don't know what it is. But the Wyoming Pastors Network is not an ecumenical endeavor. We are not involved in the process of unifying separated brethren. As wonderful as a goal that is, and somebody ought to be involved in that, but that's not what we're doing here. Okay? Uh, we're not in the business of deciding which disagreements are serious enough to warrant division and which disagreements are not serious enough to warrant division. Um, instead, the WPN is less about cooperation, joint working, than it is about coordination, synchronized working. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Now, I might appreciate having all kinds of bodies in the fight for human life. That's my passion, is life. But I don't think I'll ever be able to share the message of atheists for life. <laughs> Their first name undermines my entire approach to life issues. <laughs> Nevertheless, if the synchronization of our activity can lead to a greater impact for the benefit of the unborn and for their confused mothers, I'm all for it. To synchronize activity without co-opting the message. So if it's going to be in the interest of my smallest neighbor that I communicate uh, with the atheists for life, and I'm willing to communicate, but that's not going to change at all um, the message. Now, this is similar. Obviously, we don't have any atheists for life here, and, and uh, that's probably not going to be possible or desired in the Wyoming Pastors Network. That's okay. <clears throat> but this is similar to what we want to accomplish in the Wyoming Pastors Network. You are here because you share the conviction. That the sanctity of marriage is good for all men and women, not just for Christian men and women. You share the conviction that the sanctity of life is good for the mother and for the child alike. You share the conviction that the free exercise of religion is good not just for Christians or Muslims, but for all Americans. But you also while sharing these three core convictions, you also have a particular and a nuanced theology, a way of expressing these things. And each one of you in the room, or certainly each denomination represented, is going to express it in a different way. And that's okay. Our goal is not to change your message one whit. Our goal is to supply you with enough information that you can know when and how to make your case in the way that has the biggest impact. And the reason that's our goal is because we know that when we have assisted you in that, we will be assisting all of us in the cause of the whole network. So with those opening remarks, um, I hope maybe this gives you some uh, clarity uh, on, on what we're trying to accomplish. We welcome dialogue, um, uh, want to serve you in the, in the best way that we can. And uh, so take these thoughts web them together with the uh, with the list agreement um, that you can pick up and uh, let's have a conversation about how to make it better. Um, with that, I'm about to turn over the floor to Dr. Anderson for his next presentation. Um, I just wanted to personally thank him for making the trip all the way out from Washington, D.C. today to help us celebrate Martin Luther's birthday. <laughs> and I wore this as a, as a, I don't normally wear this, but I thought I'd give it to you so he could wear it um, on the plane on the way home. So this is Martin Luther's seal, and I know you'll appreciate this.
In this first um, session this afternoon, um, we want to talk about religious liberty. Um, and so, before turning um, immediately to where we uh, left things this morning on the religious liberty for uh, people after the Supreme Court's decision, um, I want to start by just kind of talking about religious liberty in general uh, and how to understand uh, what religion is, what religious liberty is. Um, from again, from a, a philosophical or natural law, how to talk about religious liberty in the abstract before applying it, particularly uh, in this context. Um, and the start is to think, well, you know, if we're talking about religious liberty, we need to have an idea of well, the liberty of what. You know, what's the religious part of religious liberty? Most people, when they talk about economic liberty, they have an idea of what the economy is about. They talk about freedom of speech. They have an idea of what speech is about. So when we talk about freedom of religion, religious liberty, free exercise of religion, what is it that we're um, getting at? And I think a sound uh, philosophical approach uh, to religion views religion as something along the following lines. It's the search for um, the adherence to the relationship with an action in accordance with the ultimate truth about man and the universe. Uh, I'm going to go through that again, but the, the four steps here, there's a search, there's an adherence, there's a relationship, and there's an action in accordance. Um, and the idea that there's something about human nature that makes men and women seek out the truth about the universe. So there's something about human nature that makes us inclined to ask those questions about the ultimate things about the nature of reality, the nature of the human person. What is our origin and what is our destiny? Uh, what's the origin and the destiny of the universe? Is there a God? What does God require of me? What does God require of you? Um, now, obviously, Catholics and Protestants, Christians and Jews and Muslims and Mormons and um, uh, uh, Buddhists and Baha'i and Jains, they answer all these questions radically differently. You know, there's more or less radical difference depending on how close um, uh, the denominations or the religious traditions are. Um, but the thing that they kind of have in common, you know, what makes all those various communities I just rattled off religious communities, is that they're engaged in this sort of an enterprise. They're searching for the truth about these ultimate questions. They're adhering with whatever they discover to be the truth. They're having a relationship with a God, if they believe the truth about the universe is that there's a God, and then they're trying to act in accordance with um, whatever it is that they believe to be true. So religious liberty is simply creating the space for those religious activities to take place. Right? Religious liberty is creating the space for men and women, free from government coercion, free from government interference, to seek out the truth about God, to adhere with that truth, to relate with God, to worship God, to act in accordance with God's laws. And this is the crucial part, as they understand it, right? Not as I understand the truth, not as you understand the truth, but as the individual believer understands the truth, even when we think that they actually haven't reached the truth, even when we think that they really, you know, that they have a false understanding of the truth. The role of the state here is to say, we're not picking winners and losers in the religious debates. We're leaving you free to settle this for yourself, to seek it out for yourself. Now, why is it that religious liberty is a natural right? Uh, so think about it. we don't just say that religious liberty is a nice added um, benefit the government you know, uh, kind of um, uh, concedes to us. We say it's a natural right that the government has to respect. Um, I think here it's to see that with religious liberty as a natural right um, is about trying to respect the human nature that we have 
as beings that seek the truth about God, um, so that the state is inherently limited by human nature. So you think about what limits government, one of the things that limits government is respecting our nature as religious animals, religious creatures, truth-seeking creatures, to be able to partake of this quest free from state interaction. And one of the best ways of illustrating this is to simply quote George Washington and James Madison. Uh, so George Washington, in his letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, uh, he writes to the Jewish community in Rhode Island. Here's what he says. He says, quote, The citizens of the United States have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protections should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support." End quote. So what's Washington getting at? Now, Washington is saying that, you know, most recently the pinnacle of kind of uh, human progress was John Locke's letter concerning toleration. And what Locke had said was that religious toleration was a good thing, that you should tolerate uh, dissenting sects and dissenting uh, congregations and dissenting denominations, um, simply as a matter of there will be fewer wars of religion if we have religious toleration. Um, and think about it, the Hebrew community, uh, the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, they've experienced, you know, for the past 2,000 years of their existence, uh, being treated as a lesser than organization, being merely tolerated. Washington's letter says, we are different. As the United States of America, all we ask from you is that you be good citizens and that you defend the Constitution. And then we don't say that we're merely tolerating you, as if it's, you know, a concession that we're making to you. He says it's no more that toleration is spoken of as if we're the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. Washington is saying that you as Jewish citizens have a natural right to be Jewish. In the United States of America, we're going to respect your right to be Jewish, even if the majority of us are Christians and we think you should be Christians and we pray for your conversion, we're not going to coerce your conversion. And we're not merely going to tolerate you, we're going to respect your right to be Jewish. Madison then explains why. So James Madison, the father of the Constitution, in his uh, Memorial on Remonstrance, it's a short document that he wrote about a proposed uh, Virginia uh, tax system to support clergy, uh, this is what he says, and he kind of gives the theoretical framework for why there's a natural right to religious freedom. He says, because we hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth, that religion, or the duty which we owe to our Creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Therefore, the religion of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man. And it is the right of every man to exercise it as <coughs> these may dictate. <coughs> this right is in its nature an unalienable right. It is unalienable because what is here a right towards men is a duty towards the Creator. It is the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable. This duty is precedent both in order of time and in degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. So there's a lot packed in to what Madison just said there. You know, first he makes a statement about the nature of religion. Now that is the nature of religion uh, that the duty which we owe to our Creator can only be uh, fulfilled by conscience and conviction, not by force or violence. So he's making an argument that it's the nature of religion that it can only be a voluntary action. Uh, and then he's saying that it's the nature of religion that the duty which we owe to the Creator takes precedence over the duty that we owe to our neighbors. Mm. 
And so he says, you know, so his argument is both a vertical and horizontal, similar to what I was discussing about marriage. Vertical, because man has a duty to God, man then has a right with respect to other men. And he says that this duty that we owe to the Creator takes precedence both in order of time and degree of obligation to civil society. So because what we owe to the Creator takes precedence to then what we owe to Caesar, it places limits on Caesar's authority. And it's a duty to the Creator creates the right that we have for religious freedom. The right is what creates the space for us to fulfill our duties. Uh, another way of saying this, a, a way that I'm certain uh, Luther would be happy about in his anniversary, <laughs> is to uh, cite John Henry Cardinal Newman, <laughs> great Anglican, uh, who said that conscience has rights because conscience has duties. And I think this is one of the things that we're now missing in the, in the cultural context of the United States. We talk about rights that we have, and we almost never talk about duties that we have. We talk about the freedoms that we have, we talk about the rights of conscience, but we don't understand that why that right of conscience matters so much is that we have a duty to form our conscience and a duty to follow our conscience. And so one of the things, if you're the Little Sisters of the Poor, of the Order of Nuns, who will have their case decided by the Supreme Court this spring, it's precisely because they took that duty seriously, they formed their conscience, they believe they have a duty to follow their conscience, that they cannot abide by what the Obama administration is trying to make them do. But if you think conscience is just um, you know, uh, uh, um, doing whatever you feel like, right? so there's two different understandings of conscience. Newman said conscience is a stern monitor. right? It's monitoring our actions, and it's doing it in a very uh, stern way. That's radically different than kind of um, the way that the movie A Man for All Seasons presented um, uh, 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 Thomas More was that it was all about him. You know, he says, "Well, it's my conscience." Emphasis on the word "my," not emphasis on the word "conscience." And so, a lot of it is, you know, is this primarily about kind of self-authenticity, being authentic to ourselves, or is it about being authentic to the truth? Uh, that we're forming ourselves to the truth. I think a sounder understanding of religious freedom and of the rights of conscience see that it's a political protection for the individual to form their conscience and then follow their conscience, because they have a duty to do so. And I just think talk of duties in the United States, talk about obligations that are precedent in order of time and degree, is largely foreign to my generation, in a way that it was natural for Madison and Washington. You know, the quotes that I read you um, they, uh, present that. So now the question becomes, all right, if that's kind of the philosophical foundation about what religion is, what religious liberty is, why it matters, why it's a natural right, the question is, how did the founding fathers intend to protect it? And this was always fun when I was teaching undergraduates, was to ask this question, because they would almost always say, the First Amendment to the Constitution. The First Amendment is how the founders intended to protect religious freedom. And they would get partial credit for that answer. Uh, they probably wouldn't get 50% credit, it would probably be less than half credit. Because the First Amendment of the Constitution is an afterthought in our system of government. Uh, you remember the Federalists thought that the Bill of Rights was unnecessary. They said we don't need a First Amendment saying Congress shall make no law, dot, 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 because nothing in the actual Constitution authorizes Congress to make any of those laws. And so by having a Bill of Rights making it look like Congress can do anything except for the things in the Bill of Rights. That was their fear. They proved to have great foresight, because that's exactly what has ended up happening. Um, so their way of protecting religious freedom was by protecting freedom in general. So here's a good argument. Think about the bakers, the flowers, the producers. <coughs> Economic freedom and religious freedom go hand in hand. Uh, freedom in general, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press, free exercise of religion go hand in hand. Uh, what you want to do is create a, have an ecosystem of freedom, have a civilization that protects freedom, and that'll be one of your best ways of protecting religious freedom. It's not that you can just have an overgrowing government and then hope to exempt yourselves from the regulatory state, that you actually have to keep the regulatory state in check in the first place, which is what the founders tried to do. Um, so if you read through the American founding, uh, the documents, especially the Federalist Papers, I'm going to look at Federalist 10, Federalist 51 in particular, they said we should have an extended republic 
and have federalism. And what they meant by this was, in Federalist 10, Madison says, well, you know, how can you deal with factions? He says, there, there, there are two things you can do. You can either remove the cause of factions, but the cause of factions is freedom. So removing the cause isn't a solution because we're trying to protect freedom. He says, or you can try to control factions. And he said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to control them. We're going to control them by having an extended uh, republic, so covering a large geographical uh, 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 population, so that the various factions would be warring against each other. Uh, the idea here being that you would have northerners competing with southerners, manufacturers competing with agriculturalists, uh, business competing with uh, uh, traders, um, Baptists competing with uh, Lutherans, competing with Catholics, competing with Anglicans, having lots of different interests, uh, all competing with one another, would prevent any one interest from being able to oppress the others. So that was one of their ideas. The other idea was having representation. Um, this is where you're <coughs> 51. Madison says, if men are were angels, no government would be necessary. And if angels were to govern men, you wouldn't need external or internal controls. But in framing a government that's going to be administered by men, he says, you know, you first need to enable the government to control the governed, and then the next place, oblige it to control itself. So that's Madison's question. How to design this form of government? Uh, and so federalism, divide power between the 50 states and Washington, D.C. Make Washington, D.C. a government of limited and enumerated powers. So Washington, D.C. only has those powers explicitly mentioned in the Constitution and reserve all of the other powers to the 50 states. Uh, that way, the 50 states, thank you, if, if California is going uh, bad, you can move to Wyoming. If Wyoming starts going bad, you can move to Montana. <laughs> Montana goes bad, I don't know where you go. <laughs> but the idea here is that by having the 50 states, uh, having them retain uh, broad powers and having the federal government only have very limited and enumerated ones, you limit the potential uh, for corruption and overreach. He then said divide the powers in the government, have the executive, the legislative, and the judicial powers. And what we've recently seen is that the executive is doing all sorts of legislative activities. And the judicial branch of government seems to be doing all sorts of legislative activities. They're legislating from the bench when the Supreme Court redefined marriage. So it's by disregarding all the founders' structures and designs that we run into these sorts of problems. It was only after they had set up this entire form of government that they then tacked on the First Amendment to the Constitution. And, and that's just an important um, uh, thing to highlight, because I'm going to turn now to talking about some of the challenges we face. And one of the common threads that you're going to see about this is that government shouldn't be doing this in the first place. Right? So it's not so much that we need an exemption from a bad law, it's that we shouldn't have a bad law at all. So I'm going to um, go through the HHS mandate, um, the Hobby Lobby case, and now the Little Sisters case, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the Baker 